spent the last 18 years of my life working for ARM, but before that I uh, used to work for Plessy Semiconductors and then Philips, um, all doing microelectronics essentially since I came out of a university. So I've, I've had a, uh, a, a, a good time with microelectronics and it is very pertinent at this point when I retired three years ago that certainly Moore's Law was, was starting to bump against the edges a little bit, a little bit rather more than it had done in the past, and it's had its rough days in the past as well. So it's a, the Moore's Law and me have had this relationship, so it's appropriate, I think, to, that I tell the tale a little bit about it. Uh, so, got to start to look at electronics, because electronics is... Um, the, the time when electricity was used, first used for something that wasn't either heating or lighting, so not power, so it's electronics for other things. And really I think the, the beginning of electronics was around 1830, quite a long time ago. 1830 and the, the, the driving force from it was the electric, electrical telegraph. And uh, to get range on the electrical telegraph they had to use relays as a relay, as a regenerator, if you will. And so the relay as an electronic amplifier, the first electronic amplifier, came to be around 1830. And I think a real, that we should consider that as the, the first instances of electronics making appearance. Now, it's pretty difficult to say when it was actually invented because there seem to have been several people who accidentally put this thing together. They, they needed to, to regenerate the signal and they produced a thing which you would now say was a, a, an electromagnetic amplifier. i move on a little bit because the other thing that, uh, that happened from very early age, ages was the magnetic amplifier. We see transformers these days, you're still familiar with transformers, but they use them as amplifiers. Um, by controlling the saturation point of the core, you control the coupling between the primary and secondary. And it's a fairly simple thing to do, but they used to make control systems of electrical power systems. I, had, I once worked on a radar which had uh, magnetic amplifiers to control the 10 kilowatt motor that spun the, spun the machine. Contro that's the way they controlled the speed, that's the way they controlled the input power. And then, of course, valves, not all of which looked like that. But these are definitely uh, electronic devices. They were providing electronic amplification. So 1904, the diode, 1906, the triode. And the interesting thing from my point of view is all these technologies are still in use today. So the relay is still there. The transformer is still there. Magnetic ampli amplifiers are actually still used in some switch mode power supplies because you can saturate ferrite cores just as easily as you could the old magnetic um, laminated ones. And valves, of course, rather specialized areas, each one of these, where the characteristics of that science, that technology, enables some benefit to be made, and then they're still used today. They're not the mainstream electronics anymore, but they're still valuable in a niche. I'm going to spend just a moment to, to, to focus on what Albert Einstein told us. Because I don't think that we really understand what engineers and scientists do. We kind of do it. I used to say that about um, bumblebees, that um, bumblebees, because of the knowledge of aeronautics, they can't possibly fly. They don't have enough wing to, uh, to uh, muscle area. And, uh, of course, bumblebees not really being well educated, don't know that they can't fly, they just sort of flap their wings and they fly. And so I think it's, it's useful to, to pause and ask ourselves as engineers or scientists, what is it that we do? And Einstein gave us this clue because he said, Einstein, the scientists investigate what already is, engineers create what has never been. And it's very thought provoking actually. And uh, so, he, but when you break it down a little bit, scientists, discover science. So they, they, they take the universe and they identify things in that universe and they discover ways of manipulating them after they've learned to understand them. Now they don't make products however but what they do is they encapsulate the science and it's the engineers that you expect to exploit that because the engineers their role is exploiting. They're there to deliver something a thing, a tangible thing or a, a method or something which can be exploited for money. 
we're the money end of this, uh, this exercise. Um, it's the money conversion part of the process. And yet, if you don't have the money conversion part of the process, then the scientists never get the money that they need to do the discovery. So it's a closed loop. But it does actually explain something which I think we're rather poor on understanding is the role of scientists and the role of engineers. Engineers are there to create actual solutions, not three quarters of it. And I know lots of engineers which have got to the three quarter stage quite well. Uh, but they're measured as, you know, if the product goes out and it sells and it makes money, then it's a success. No matter how successful it is technically, if it doesn't sell, if it's late, if it's over budget and blows all of the, uh, the profits that were ever going to be made out of it, then it's a failure, no matter how successful technically it was. And they have to use available science, and we'll see this as we go <laughs> along. Engineers, because they have to deliver, have to deliver something which is there. They can't use a science which has yet to be invented as part of a product. So they can't use an anti-gravity machine, no matter how attractive it might seem, unless somebody in the science department has discovered how to do anti-gravity. It's not there. So anyway, back in 1947, which is two years before I was born, um, William Schottky and John Barden and Wal uh, Walter Britton, Britton, Bratton uh, demonstrated as scientists the uh, ability to effectively control the flow of electrons or conduct conductors. We won't be too specific about whether it's electrons or holes because I don't actually think he knew at that time what he was doing. But by a third electrode influenced the flow of current going through uh, a conductor. Now it was very interesting as a concept because nobody had believed that you could do it before. Now. He didn't ever expect that that was going to be a product. Now, it was, it was pretty useful, perhaps. The game was awful. I mean, it got a little bit better when they actually did make the first junction transistor there. But the, the essence of it was he proved the concept that it was actually possible to modulate the current flow uh, with, a, with a side electrode. Um, when it became a product, and that was just four years later. Now that's pretty good to take a concept, make a product out of it, and actually start shipping it as a product just four years later, when there was no fabs. There was no fabs already sitting there waiting. There was nobody who knew how to do this thing. But the implementation of it was quite simple. A piece of germanium and two blobs of indium, indium was, were positioned on either side of it. And then the whole lot was raised to almost melting point such that it produced some, uh, some junctions. Yield wasn't brilliant. Manufacturably, ma manufacturability was not high. These were very individually made. Look at the bonding wires one at a time. And it sat into, inside this little tin can. The tin can is probably the most familiar thing which still stays today. <laughs> but some of you will remember the OC71. Oh, yes. <laughs> This was the transistor. Whenever you wanted to do anything which constituted small signal, you used OC71. And when you scraped the paint off it, you got a photo detector, didn't you? Because they used um, silicon grease, I think it was, inside a, a, an encapsulation which was, which was clear, and you ended up with a transistor which was light sensitive. So engineers, scientists, they love experimenting. But one thing that happened very quickly is the concept of other forms in which you might modulate current flow. So the, the, uh, by the PNP, NPN transistors, the junction FET, and the FET apparently was the first, um, let's say, the, if you look at what, what uh, they prototyped, it would, turns out to have been a FET, a junction FET, not a bipolar device. And then, of course, the insulated gate, FET. And these are all different architectures, but they exploit essentially the same concept. It's, uh, sorry, implementations of the same architecture or of a similar architecture. They're more producible, more robust, but they were still jolly expensive. And, uh, and I guess the other thing that was on your Christmas list back those days was a seven transistor radio or a five transistor radio if, you, if your parents were tight. Transistors were expensive, so you had to use them effectively. And so you used analog, you used analog ap approaches. It may not be as numerically accurate. Nobody knew anything about numerically accurate at that point. It was whether you could ra receive Radio Luxembourg or not that mattered. <laughs> <coughs> and 
you got this this additional functionality out of a transistor, a single transistor, by using it in the analog mode. Now, of course, an awful lot of things move on once you move into the digital domain. It becomes possible to improve the performance, but this was good enough, and it, and it produced a product which was cost-effective enough, and those engineers are there to produce cost-effective product. Anyway, by 1957-58, the first integrated circuit concept has come about, so it's 1970, what was the other date? I knew I was going to have to do this. 1951, the first commercial transistor, 1957-58, so six years later, the first integrated circuit was demonstrated as a concept. It was enabled by J uh, John Gene Herney, I never quite know how to pronounce his name, and Jack Kilby over two years. Um, Herney really had, uh, had the concept of the planar transistor, putting all the contacts on one side, because you can't really make an integrated circuit if the contacts or some of the contacts are on the bottom. And it seems only a very small architectural change. And the idea of doing a double diffuse junction, which nobody had done before. And uh, Jack Kilby, I mean, call that an integrated circuit, it had three components on it. And I think it was as much as anything, you, you know, these are scientists, they were demonstrating the concept. And, the, and then, of course, the engineers came along, or the marketeers said, hey, it would be really good if we could produce a circuit with more components on it than that. And so the first integrated circuit came along just nine years after the first transistor. Now it's a real integrated circuit. Not much, four transistors and two resistors, but it sold for $120 and they couldn't make enough of them. They were used for all sorts of, sort of computery related activities, but, uh, you know, it's... As size goes, it was pretty small. You could get a lot of these onto a, onto a printed circuit board. Um, of course, implicitly with this is a move to a digital world. It's not analog anymore. This is a switched circuit. It's bi-stable. And, uh, and the thing that, about that is it's a fairly inefficient use of transistors, but it's a scalable architecture. So somebody had spotted, and I'm not sure whether they realized they'd spotted it or that, at that time, that they were going to be able to put more of these down onto a circuit. And doing, doing it digitally, you could, make, you could make a counter if you put four of these together. You could have a binary counter or a decimal counter. You know, the, the concept of doing that was already sitting in somebody's mind. Well, Robert Noyce founded Fairchild to make this integrated circuit. And he didn't have a process or anything else, so he got, a, he got a fab up around the 2N697, which was a Mesar transistor. Mesar is not flat, but all the components are on the top side, but it, he still had to have a, a vertical architecture to it. Um, but it was on the way, you can see that when he was thinking about that, he was still aiming towards this planar solution. But it was state machines, ultimately CPUs would come out of the digital approach, and of course memory. Memory. Previously memory had been um, delay lines and other kind of photo-optical systems that people have been trying to use, and magnetic of course. Uh, these are, this is what memory was, but somebody realized, you know, you could put lots of these things down, you could store bits, and bits are, uh, if you start, we start manipulating bits, you can use Boolean logic on it, Boolean mathematics, to do processes, you know, the, the sky started to be the limit, and by 1968, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore founded Intel to make memory chips, so they, these guys were quite serious about the opportunity that they'd spotted, uh, and they sometime scientist, sometime engineer, but by the time they were going there, it was to make memory. That's what they were about. They, do, they didn't know what the memory was going to be used for, but it's actually a fundamental um, mind shift, because memory is a product that you can use without knowing what you're going to use it for. So it's, it's late configuring. You can make the die, make the chip, package the device, and you can use it for conceptually storing a photograph, storing data about your wage packets, or accounts for the country, or anything like that. You just know that memory is going to be useful without knowing what it's going to be used for. Anyway, come 1965, and this is just a shade before Intel was founded, so when, so when Intel laid claim to more 
to Gordon Moore and say, you know, he's ours and it was his guy. He wasn't actually working for them at the time. It was 1965 when uh, he wrote an article working for Fairchild. He wrote an article cramming more components into integrated circuits. And Carver Mead in their book, I can't remember what the name of the book was in 1970, linked that with, the t with something which they called Moore's Law. But when he thought of this concept, he was designing for Fairchild chips which had 30 to 40 components on board at that time and he was anticipating that next year he would be able to design chips with 80 components on it and he extrapolated we you know, could have as many as 65,000 components on some of these integrated circuits well actually you know it's pretty fair pretty forward thinking of him but then I guess a lot of people, as history goes on, they make forward-thinking statements. Not most of them, go, not most of them, not all of them work out, but some of them do. And so history tends to be written by the winners. And his was a winner. So what does 30 to 40 components look like? So 1975, 65 rather, we had effectively the birth of the 74,000 series of logic devices. You know, two input NAND, two input NOR, two input. Uh, uh, or and and, and some um, XORs, I think only two or three XORs because they were, it pushed the bounds too much. And if you look, that's the implementation of one of those gates in transistor transistor logic, and that amounts to, by the time you multiply that by four, then that amounts to about the, 80 com the uh, 30 to 40 components. And it used this EDA technique, which is, tends to be rather forgotten these days, and this thing which of course we call the guessing stick, <laughs> which was what it was good for. Um, and, but this, this form factor dates from 1965, we're still very familiar with it. And of course here's another example of a technology which was dated back then, but it's still useful today. You can still go into the RS catalogue and you can still buy 74,000 series logic. You can buy it in CMOS these days as well, but it still produces the same Boolean functions in the box. Uh, the process technology gives us different architectural options, you know, faster or lower power, whichever you want to, you want to have. Um, and depending on your application, you're able to make, make choice of that. But essentially the system design has been separated from the process. And it's worth remembering that. So you've got ECL logic which came out, you've got I squared C logic, you've got um, there are plenty there are many forms of logic, some of which just disappeared. Four phase dynamic logic was one of them, um, but it was important in its day for a vari for various reasons. But others are still there, so you still do actually find I squared C logic devices out there. They're very <laughs> They're good because you can produce very cheap chips because they're actually a very simple process. Um, and if you're not making something complicated, then that's still perhaps the right way to do it in some things. Now by 1970, just a shade more, we've, uh, we've moved forward to 300 transistors, 75 gates, and the birth of what was called large-scale integration. The previous stuff was actually called medium scale integration, so 7400, but large scale, 300 gates, three, sorry, 75 gates, 300 transistors. You also notice we've moved from devices to transistors. Uh, because if you're do, doing a TTL logic, you've got resistors and you've got diodes in there as well as the transistors. And you also have some funny things like double emitter transistors. Um, but when you move to CMOS, then the only devices in there are two transistors, a PMOS and an NMOS device. The rest of it's metal connecting together and nobody cares about metal, do they? It's just ways of connecting up transistors. But anyway, by 1970 we got this, com this level of complexity that we're now starting to identify. It was so complex incidentally it had to go into a big package. A four, is that 40 or a 24? It's certainly not the 16 pin. Um, it had to go into a big package and it delivered quite a staggering amount of functionality, 16 uh, Boolean logic and arithmetic functions on a 4-bit operands. But the real breakthrough on this thing is it's, a, it's an architectural expansion right from the beginning. You can take several of these, four of them, and you can put four of them side by side and connect them together on a printed circuit board. And you know that next year you can take those four and you can put them together on a piece of silicon and fit the same die. You've now recognized the value of Moore's law. 
Why would you want to do that? Well, four fours are, uh, are 16, so you can make a 16-bit process, a 16-bit arithmetic block, which is going to, to fit onto the, to the piece of silicon that today you can only put a 4-bit block on. Um, so it can be paralleled on a PC board or on the next generation of process. Now, digital architecture, I've already said it, is largely process and technology ge geometry independent, which is fantastic because it means that you can start to reuse function blocks rather than have to design them again from scratch. Traditionally, everything that I've talked about up till now has been designed on a clean piece of paper with a pencil. And uh, you, it was the worst thing you could do as an engineer, and that's to take any guidance from anybody who's done it before. You always want to do it yourself. You want to do it the way that you want to do it because it's better. And the idea of starting to use, first of all, logic blocks and then these LSI logic blocks to create systems was reveled against by the engineers. Um, it was really only desperation of productivity. They were being driven hard by their bosses to get their product <laughs> out and the only way they could do that is to use standard components rather than do it themselves. The masks on these things were pretty cheap. You could get turnarounds, you could get masks for, thou for thousands, prototype devices for thousands and turnarounds in a couple of weeks. They were very quick. Uh, the masks were all done by uh, uh, what was called cut and strip using rubylith uh, and, 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 and basically XY plotters with, with sharp knives on them. But I want you to bear in mind this block because it's a 4-bit ALU and when we, when we go forward with the processes you'll see the 4-bit ALU come up in other areas. Now that 300 transistor capability really enabled the emergence of the mainframe computer. Up until that time there had been mainframe computers using earlier technologies including valves, um, including relays I understand. I've never seen an example of that. But it was the 74 series and the LSI really made computers uh, affordable. But if you go looking for the computer here, you'll see, well, that's obviously the monitor. That's your tape storage, so your bulk memory. Those are two line printers. So that's your, out, your output device. Uh, somewhere out of sight on this thing is your input device, which is a tape reader. Which, uh, which you sat down and laboriously with the teletype punched holes, 8-bit holes in a, in a piece of tape which ran on forever. The processor is in these cabinets back here and that part over the next couple of years diminished from cabinets to a small rack such that when I went to university in 1972 there was uh, LSI 11s which were the uh, digital uh, computer was actually in a box this big, that tall, and that deep, and it had been its predecessor had been in several racks. So this is again the level of integration, but you can't see it very easily there. These line printers, if you've never looked at them, are fascinating in, the, in themselves. You you know the answer to that. These are printing printing lines, and they have long tape with all the letters of the alphabet on the tape. And then you have a row of little electromagnets, and as the letters zoom backwards and forwards, the electromagnets hit the appropriate letter against the paper and it was phenomenal. This is from an era when you didn't really have the electronics ability that you have now to produce machines that were capable of doing this. It's phenomenal. But the power available was around one MIP. So all of that lot gave you about a MIP. You've got hundreds to thousands of MIPs in your smartphone today and in those, in those days you had a MIP and it was shared using batch schemes because you, you know, nobody could afford to have all of this. And the predominant users were the accounts departments because they had numerical applications. Some universities had one or two. But electronic designers didn't start to use these for nearly another half decade because electronic design wasn't seen as mathematical. It was, you know, that was another thing. Some, somebody hadn't got around to the art to thinking about modeling logic as a mathematical process which was, uh, which was targeted at computers. Anyway, 1971, we now come to the 4004. And this was very clever because essentially it was still using the 300 transistor level of integration capacity, but they'd use PMOS dynamic logic to achieve that result because that enabled them to use minimum size transistors and to stack them in rather more effectively. But it was a rather wacky uh, implementation and if you look at the 
the architectural diagram now, you'll see that here's the ALU that we've talked about before. This is a 4-bit machine and that's that 4-bit ALU. So already we're able to, to put rather more stuff around that implementation to make a processor out of it rather than just an arithmetic unit. Now it wasn't made as a general purpose programmable computer, it was made as um, an engine for that calculator. So it was a calculator which was designed as Busycom, it was sold as Unicom, but essentially the input were the buttons, the output was a printer, there was no memory in it, uh, basically it, it worked with um, decimal digits and so if you had a 10 digit calculation then the, the algorithm went round this root loop 10 times. So it was uh, a simple digit at a time calculation and of course that was more than wonderful as far as an electronic system because they used to do calculators like that mechanically. And that, that calculator is only four function and it was very slow doing divide. Anyway, I use this one from time to time. Um, it's a good graph. It came from uh, the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon back in 1999, and I still use it because it's a nice bridge for this whole Moore's Law era. With one touch of a button, I can take it back to 1975 and the 1000 transistor level, and I can see some other features in there. I can see the IBM PC coming in at about the 10K transistor level of integration. Um, we saw the Apple, this is not the Mac, this is the Apple PC coming in shortly afterwards. And Acorn, and you'll come back to that because there's more, more sense, Acorn was the uh, uh, BBC Computers in School company um, and they wanted a, uh, a chip to get the performance that they needed and they couldn't buy it so they simply went out and made it and that was the ARM1 which I'll see in a moment but that was enabled at about the 200,000 components per integrated circuit level 1987 and that's what the, the uh, ARM1 looked like it was a 32-bit processor 30, 35,000 gates, 140K transistors, so that's using four, transi four transistors per gate, which is the normal calculation ratio. And it's interesting now because you can see there's a 32-bit ALU and there's the 34-bit ALU that we, we showed earlier. That's one chip now, so the ALU has gone in this relatively short period of time from being everything you could possibly produce in one chip to being something which is just a corner or even not even a corner of the chip, just a little small piece of it. And uh, so it's the ARM 32-bit processor, which in those days meant Acorn RISC machine, 32-bit um, data path, 24-bit address, 8 megahertz. I mean, everything about this was blistering. Pa a data path which is that wide. Um, who could possibly ever want more address than 24 bits of memory could give you? That's huge. 8 megahertz, I mean previously we've been t talking about these things ticking over in the, in the hundreds of kilohertz regions. So the, this is a phenomenal amount of processing power that you now start to have and it was targeted at every school. So this isn't big businesses anymore, it isn't just accounts department in big businesses anymore, it's not just the leading research departments in, in leading universities, it's everywhere. But it's only one per school, it's not one per class even, it's just one per school. And they got pretty close to delivering it, but Acorn, they screwed up by not having a big enough imagination because they, they had set up a manufacturing facility to enable them to make all of the computers that the BBC program needed. So that was essentially however many schools there are in the UK, in Australia and New Zealand, but not the rest of the world. IBM on the other hand that suddenly realized that this was a big thing and actually it needed to be attract, uh, attacked in a worldwide level and so they marketed to the rest of the world right from the beginning and uh, so when eventually Acorn and IBM bumped into each other then Acorn lost. Now because Acorn lost however, ARM happened. So if Acorn hadn't lost it would have been a different story. Um, now we still got in 1991 we've now got a level of integration which made this available as a concept. So now here's that ARM 
one as an implementation it's actually now a little bit a little bit changed it's got 32 bit address space now not just 24 and there's some other aspects of it which were which were implemented in dynamic logic to make them more uh, efficient have now been moved out into static logic um, to make them more robust and reusable but the idea at least was inside a chip by the time we've got to 1991 you can't fill it with the processor anymore you need to put some other stuff in there and arm um, we could design a processor we knew about the processor but we didn't know what other people wanted to put around it you know there are market opportunities out there and people who knew about medicine who knew about um, traffic systems people who were thinking about things like uh, global positioning the people working on cell phones all of those have a need for for a processor but they but they also have other other logical functionality which they want to put down which is specialized for their markets and so arm had quite a revolutionary thought we can't do the whole chip what we've got to do is we've got to supply the bit that we know we understand and we've got to enable people to connect it up into systems and that's what actually turned out to be a successful thing to do so this is the CPU, still more or less the same block diagram, still now a 32-bit ALU. And you can see here the, st the structure of the, the CPU is still more or less the same, but that little bit down there is the entire 32-bit ALU. Uh, sort of lost in the, not even on the corner, even just a little, almost a speck of dust. The 4-bit ALU, well, it's one of the dots on that, so it's not filling a chip anymore. In 20 years, since the 4-bit ALU became a tiny part of a 32-bit RISC processor, which in turn is a small part of a typical chip today, Moore's Law in action. This is the real pace of Moore's Law. And one of the problems that I'd heard said to me a number of times is Moore's Law is only doubling in complexity every 12 to 18 months. If it was faster, people would take it serious. The problem is that ev every one of these design steps was just a case of, well, it's only twice what you did before. It's only twice as many transistors, only twice as big a logic circuit. You know, we'll give you some more engineers, we'll upgrade your, upgrade your workstations, but it's just twice what you did before. You don't need to have new tools or new methods or anything complicated like that. But nevertheless, at the same time, we were having to handle that times two every 12 to 18 months. So the next problem was always bigger than the one before. And, and it's actually a square law. It's not linear. It's an exponential. So th because of the increased connectivity, making a system that complex work becomes increasingly difficult as the numbers get bigger. So I can still return then to my, to my graph here. And I can now put ARM on there at the million transistor level. Another data point on this graph is today, which is somewhere out here. And that to give an example of what you could get back in 2017, no, 2012, this one, you could get a two gigabyte micro SD card for $5, which is 20 billion transistors. There's no way of looking at it. In those days, that's the way they put them together. Now, it's 20 billion transistors, which are non-volatile memory transistors, so it's not a cross-coupled pair. It's a very simple structure, and it packs very, very densely. But nevertheless... It's an illustration of the level of, of uh, density that is being delivered by that time. It is up 20,000 times the number of transistors over the 25 years of ARM's existence up till that point. Ten times the frequency. You can think of that as 200,000 times the functionality on a chip. You can't design the chip in 2012 in the same way as you designed a chip in uh, 1991. 200,000 times more complicated. And I'm going to tell you even more. Because I'm, but in 2012, Moore's Law put a billion transistors into production. This is ASIC transistors, so log random logic rather than memory. This is the NVIDIA Tegra 3 CPU, which is broadly equivalent to the uh, uh, ARM A4 which was in use in the first uh, smartphones. Um, it has a billion transistors in it. It's got four CPUs in it. It's got a DSP. Can't see which of the blocks it is. It doesn't really matter and shouldn't get diverted to it too much. Uh, but that was all together in one chip, amounted to a billion transistors on 28 micron. Um, you can see how big it is. It's not very big. 
Um, but the other thing you notice about it is you can't see any of the structures on this anymore. It's just a blur. These are only visible because a large part of them are actually memory. Because these, these are the CPUs. So one of those little ARM CPUs is one of the small gray boxes on here. These are cache memories, which are just local memory to the CPU to make them faster. And as you zoom in with an electron microscope, then eventually you get to a point where you can start to see the metal, the interconnectivity. This one has been stripped back so you can actually see the metal and it's not blinded by the uh, insulation layers. And you can see that there's three other transistors, three of the transistors. There's, don't forget this one has got 999,000 million brothers in there. When they wired this chip up, when it was implemented, when it was laid out, when the masks were made for it, when the design was, uh, when the, the um, timing loops were checked, they had to be checked for every transistor. You can't generalize it. They have to be done at that individual level. So we may use hierarchical design methods in the architecture of the, of the chip. We use Boolean methodology and blocks and higher, higher and higher level blocks. But there are still transistors, individual transistors at the bottom of all this lot. And those individual transistors are sitting with multiple layers of metal on top of them. So it's not just one layer of metal anymore. It's multiple layers. And in fact, currently, 10 layers is not at all uncommon. So you get another 10 times functional density simply because, because of the complexity of the thing that you're now able to produce. So that 200,000 that I was talking about is actually closer to 2 million. But it's much more difficult to count it in terms of um, polygons anymore because you're actually talking about functionality. So design of productivity has become the issue. Uh, the product possibilities offered by billions of transistors, and thank you guys uh, for doing that, for identifying the transistors and giving us these, these wonderful processes. Uh, the reality of it is, though, as engineers, unless you can actually deliver a product, then you've failed. So if you can't design your chip in a reasonable time with a reasonable team and within a reasonable budget, then it's not available. The silicon is only half, or indeed only a part of the problem. It's an important part. You can't do the chip without it. But at the same time, you haven't got a product unless you've got a design. And it's not an effective product unless it makes use of what that chip can do for you. So it's really got to make use of as large a number of the transistors that you can access as possible. And that's where companies like ARM suddenly came in. They didn't do it on purpose, but they hit the sweet spot. They were offering a CPU at the time when people were facing a design problem and they needed a large block of something to put in there to, to move part of the design into the uh, retrospective domain. They could put a chip together with a CPU, with memory, and they effectively they could add the detail to make it work after they finished the chip. So you could write that as software. They enabled the software to defer the design and they introduced it at a chip level, which it hadn't been done before. So we come back to the productivity graph, which I talked about. And that shows the, uh, what the exponential gap looks like in, in numbers. Moved from sub 100, which was affordable, to not to levels which are never going to happen. And it got worse because verification came up as a problem as well. You need to have increasingly complex circuits outside of the thing you're designing to confirm that it works. So you end up making big test benches, designing big test benches to sit around the thing that you're actually designing just to confirm it works. And it's the consequence of which was we had to move from single designers through small teams, local teams, to global teams. And global only happened, of course, because of the self-sustaining nature of this, the internet came about, personal computer came about, networking came about. It became possible to have global teams because global teams could communicate and they could communicate like they were in the same room. And it, the things that they were uh, using, clean sheet design became some reuse, essentially the logic level family became hardware and software reuse. We're not just talking about systems which are hardware only, we're talking about systems which have got software in as well. 
you start to u reuse operating systems, you start to reuse stacks, so TCP IP stacks and communication protocols, and you start to use expertise. So people who are expert on DSP design, so people who are expert at rendering images to make, I mean, you know, a smartphone these days doesn't just have little square buttons, it has buttons that have texture. They've got shading in them. They make clicks and they look real as you push a button. It actually changes the shading around it. All of this lot costs expertise. And the chip then to produce this doesn't just use one company anymore. It uses other companies to contribute and that's where Armored come in. Armored contributed this software interface into the system producers and without then very large amounts of reuse, today's electronic systems wouldn't be possible. They wouldn't just wouldn't be able to implement them. So ARM's CPU family is not just one processor, it's a range of processors. Um, from 50,000 transistors to 50 million transistors. So that's a scale of processors. The family, a few years ago now, so this is not bang up to date, had 24 processors in it. You could go into the, to their um, website and you could see the devices which are available and you could choose from 20, across the range of 24 of them for whatever it is that your application needed. And of course it's not just processors, you've got to find a way of connecting them together. So this is a, a framework which is given to the customer who's designing a chip to help him to design a chip. These are sockets, if you like, when you can drop your processes that you want in, you can get a simulation model straight out of it. You can write software for it and you can look at the performance of it entirely in computer land. It doesn't have to, you can assess what the hardware is going to be before you have to create it. And let's put a scale on this. One, two, three, four quad processors. So 16 processors in that block. DSPs, there are three illustrated there, but it'll take eight. You've got coprocessors, which are actually processors aimed at specific applications like rendering, shading, um, or maybe um, uh, protocol processing. These, and then to get that whole lot together in a way that it will the, the designer doesn't have to worry about putting it together. So you literally can take some software code. That's my egg boiled. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> I'll give myself another few minutes, if you don't mind. <laughs> and uh, you've, got to ha you've got to have the way to connect these things together without having to worry about where every wire goes. You've got to be able to connect these things together without worrying about how you're going to test it. Uh, and all of, all of these are supported by this innocent looking framework. And the other thing that's supported is the software design environment. ARM isn't a company on its own. There are, in, the, in these days, 2012, I don't know what it is now, there were 200 companies who are what ARM call partners. These are people who take some of ARM's IP, which has now become a wide spectrum of product offering, they take it and they use it to produce their own products. And their own products may be a chip or they may be an entire system. So you've got a suite of software tools, software tools to support early system development on software. So here you can prototype your hardware, you can do, you can write code on it, you can assess performance, measure performance on it and change the hardware before you do the chip design. And then inside, inside the typical smartphone there is actually 20 integrated circuits. Most people think of there just being one. Uh, some of them are specialized in special areas but they can't really be combined into one chip for various technical operating reasons. And we've seen in the main CPU how that integrates but the ARM component of it is just illustrated here as a component of a chip which is a chip in a system of which there are 20 other chips and ARM finds itself in all of those chips because some people need just a simple bit of processing memory uh, processor and memory just to do simple control systems other people need the uh, the highest performance processor that you can get as the main CPU for doing the, the graphical and, and system support aspects. And different things need different things. Wi-Fi needs one. GPS needs one. 
Bluetooth needs one. They are all just uh, integrations and all of which take ARM IP in one way or another as an aid to productivity and that's the thing. They're out there trying to get their products out as quickly as possible. They don't basically care what the technology is which is underneath it. What they're trying to do is to deliver a product. These are all digital products and therefore are inefficient by definition. But you've got billions of transistors so you don't care too much about the inefficiency. Moore's vision then was maintained for around 60 years. You'll find I've used numbers of 50, 60 and 70 in here. Um, and of course I couldn't make up my mind exactly when Moore's law started but it's at that, er that uh, scale of era. But you can see that even in the process this hasn't gone on as one company doing all of the work. Transistors and process architectures, yes they need it to be developed and this guy Asan Asanov in uh, Edinburgh University modeling individual atoms and their positions inside transistors. That's the smallest geometry stuff. But it's absolutely stunning work that he's done based on the physics, the, the mathematics of the physical processes which support um, the different types of uh, you know, PRN type materials and the field effects of the, those atoms. I mean it's phenomenal stuff that he's doing. F perversely he gets more and more powerful computers as, as the processes geom uh, geometries get smaller but also the transistors get simpler because there's fewer atoms in them. Photolithography, lenses, masks and photochemistry have been a huge part of this. Manufacturing machinery and met methodology and tools, metrology tools, how do you measure what you've created? Uh, the, the manufacturing machines, you know it's easy to make mechanical systems which will position something to less than 10 nanometers and you can do that mechanically and it's phenomenal and accuracy that you can get out of mechanical systems, people who know what they're doing. <coughs> um, handling equipment, process environmental controls, the quality of cleanliness of the air and how to, how to main, maintain it clean enough. Understanding of physics, easy thing to say isn't it? But it's the more and more we understand the physics the more we're able to make use of the characteristics that we've got because the, the models become more reliable. The use of more elements, this used to be just silicon and silicon dioxide and aluminium. It, I think there are now as many as 80 elements in use in, uh, in some of the latest processes. And electronic design automation. We've got to have tools which, look, which will support the designers trying to produce the quantity of transistors at base level. A simple planar transistor is just that, uh, but that's not going to be for the future. This ASML Extreme Ultraviolet 13 nanometer stepper which is the latest kid on the block. Only two manufacturers in the world can afford these. They're 100 million each and you probably need about 18 of them in a fab. That's a lot of, a lot of money. It's <coughs> taken a lot of money to develop these. It's been in IMEC in Belgium for goodness knows how long. 15-ish years. Um, they've been getting um, research grants from the uh, Belgian government, from the European Commission. This is all the under the table stuff which has been causing budgetary balance problems with the European Commission. But you can imagine how much money has been poured into that. It's, this is a, uh, an X-ray optical path so they can't use lenses, they can only use mirrors. It's got to have an X-ray source which produces 200 watts of 13 nanometer light. Um, and to produce that 200 watts, that's for a product production throughput rate, so it's to illuminate a wafer through, off, not through, reflecting off a mask um, in a reasonable period of time. You can't have a wafer sitting there for hours, you know, minutes is long enough, seconds is desirable. They need 200 watts and the 200 watts they get by vaporizing particles of tin, pure tin, with a 27 kilowatt carbon monoxide laser. So serious stuff to produce uh, to produce just 200 watts of uh, a fairly small light and you can see also this is the Apple A7 chip so this is the sort of thing which is sitting in your smartphone and somewhere down there right at the very bottom is the active layer that's where the transistors are all of these are layers of metal sat on top of it so we're talking about 10 or more layers of metal on top of a process 
what they said, this is to maintain Moore's law. It's not Intel that maintains Moore's law, it's teamwork that's maintained Moore's law. <coughs> yes, they do. Yeah, they, go, they connect up and down. Uh, transistors are getting ever smaller, but not the atoms. So now we come to the, to the, uh, to the rub. The silicon crystal lattice is at 0.54 of a nanometer. And today's transistor 27, uh, 2017 was 20 nanometers. So you can see the number of atoms is now down to the low hundreds. And so inside a transistor, you've only got a finite number of atoms. In the channel, you've only got a finite number of atoms. If you know anything about process technology, you'll also know that the implants, which are necessary to make it into P-type or N-type, are measured in the region of one atom per 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9. So they're, they're purely one, one dopant atom every, every million to thousand million trans, uh, regular silicon atoms. So there's every probability that there isn't an, Im an impurity in your transistor. So the effects of these, uh, these atoms, is actually, uh, of the impurity atoms, is quite long range. So we're already at a, pl at a place which is seriously difficult to make. So the transistor has moved from the bulk model through the grainy model to the atom level. And honestly, by the time we get to 14 nanometers, you don't know what you're doing. The atom is a statistical thing. It's only a probability, you know, and, and we're now playing with transistors at the levels of probability. Things like Denard scaling, which has been a driver of the industry for most of this time, Denard scaling was, was a, a wonderful present to the industry. Denard scaling said every Moore's law step, you got um, the, 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 the chip went down to a quarter of the size because the chip was smaller, the capacitances were smaller. The gains of the transistors were about the same because that's ratio of width to length. Uh, and so you ended up with improving power dissipation, so lower dissipation, increased speed, and reduced cost. And this, were, this kept the industry alive for years. You could make a chip today, it didn't matter if it was over power budget, didn't matter if it was touch and go about whether it was fast enough, didn't matter if it was expensive, because next generation you could afford it, the yield would go up, and the speed would go up. So it was fantastic. But then our scaling, scaling stopped at 100 nanometers. So we're already at 20 nanometers, when, uh, where I was saying where we were, that's the 30, 130 nanometers, and a, and a lot of processes these days are still available at 130. This was never the case historically. People only produced the smallest, latest process, but, uh, but now the fabs, older fabs, are still staying in business. Back here, the design process was much easier. You didn't have to try and take into account all of these um, atomic variabilities. You didn't have to take into account all of the optical problems that we're, we were describing earlier. It was easier to close the timing loops. Uh, all the, all the 100 nanometers made a lot, of difficult, a lot of difference. So you have difficulty making the, the transistors. They need lots more structure, and I'll touch on that momentarily. Um, architecture changes, the photolithography changes. Um, sharp increase in process complexity, the number of layers involved, the expense of the processes involved, the reworking which is inevitable, the significantly reduced yield and reliability. The argument goes that you can't actually make a chip, logically speaking. We know about the failure rate of, um, of transistors and we know about the number of transistors you've got in the bucket, then there is always transistors failed in that bucket. Chips work so it's a, it's, this is a uh, harbinger of doom type comment. You know, we can't possibly make a chip that works because the statistics tell us it can't, and yet it does. So it's back, back to the bumblebee again. Uh, the statistical nature of the atoms is showing through. So the transistor's electrical characteristics are randomly variable. So it's not something you can tune out by optimizing your process anymore the gain of transistors is going to vary by where the implant, uh, implant uh, atoms are placed. Theoretically impossible to make a chip where all the transistors work. Already possible. It's already in that state, and yet it does. So the question then is, is this the end for Moore's law? Or is it just the start of the end? Have we got there? I mean, back here, they were, the general opinion was, 
with a lot of justification we couldn't get any further than 10 or 7 nanometers because it was you know 7 to 10 nanometers look at that you know we're now talking 10 atoms inside a, a transistor it's ridiculous but latest off the press June 9, 2019 they've got this thing in they've got this baby into into fabs uh, and T TSMC and Samsung have announced that they've got to five nanometers it's at risk production now the way that fabs work basically they will say we'll we'll give you this these are likely to be the electrical characteristics if you want to do a chip you can do it but it's your risk as well uh, but they're in that state and lots of companies normally work on the basis that it's going to be risky we don't really understand the process right now but if we can get this chip out then we will have a product which has got a lead whatever the product is that they're going to make um, and so, so there are customers who are prepared to take the risk these are usually the highest the biggest players in the market so if you're somebody like Apple who is shipping what's their numbers tens of billions of processors a year in their smartphones um, then you've got a market which is big enough to support the risk of 40 odd masks at over a million pounds a time uh, is going to help these guys recover their investment in the process that they've had to make um, and if it works it'll pay off if it doesn't work they're big enough to take it but there's not many businesses that are the 5 nanometer node is the first one to be built using entirely EUV lithography. Um, global foundries, who are a pretty big player, gave up at 14 nanometers. They said they're not going to do it anymore. They're going to still continue to make the bigger processes and they're going to do other stuff, but they're not going to pursue this Moore's Law avenue anymore. Intel, of which you might have heard, they are years behind. This is the company that was always years ahead for their process. They're years behind and the, and the process that they're talking about developing is 7 nanometers. So it's not even 5 nanometers. That's my extra egg. Who wants another couple of minutes? Yeah. All right. <laughs> right. We're getting to the end. Maybe you'll be pleased to know. I don't know. So if you can't make it smaller, you can stack them higher. And that is a lot to be said for that. Because here's, here's our two dimensional transistor that's the source the drain is on the other side that's the gate which is um, uh, 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 polysilicon and the little thin layer of oxide just underneath the gate separates the gate from the drain source so that you put voltage on here and the source becomes electively electrically conductive now that's a very simple 101 on what a transistor looks like except it doesn't look like that anymore they've already gone to fin transistors where they take the transistor and they stand it up on end they wrap the gate around it in the middle and that enables you to make a, a transistor which is you know takes up less two-dimensional real estate but it started to become vertical because it's plenty of room vertical because you can go all the way up to the stars before it's a serious problem <laughs> <coughs> that's the two and a half D but now they're actually playing quite seriously with this one which is 3D what they call nanowires, don't get too carried away about that, that's really recrystallized silicon which is grown without being in contact with the base silicon and that's a big deal. These, it's necessary to have monocrystalline um, uh, structures inside the transistor and the way that it's carried forward traditionally is by having the, the crystalline um, substrate. Here it's not connected to the substrate. The substrate is doing a structural support role, but the actual nanowires themselves are the transistor channels. So these gate at one, uh, sorry, drain at one side, source at the other. The gate is wrapped around them like throttling a piece of wire. Um, it's you know nanowires tend to suggest that you're going to take some wires and you're going to sprinkle them down. It's not like that. They're built, but they're quite small. And, uh, but the, the main attraction is there's not really any uh, limit to how far you can go north on this and uh, because you're able to create good quality silicon by a deposition process and that's, that's pretty new 
Um, and of course, once you can start to stack transistors on top of one another, then you can start to stack active transistors on top of one another. You don't just have to stick to one transistor anymore. You can have a, a stack of them. And this one is a NAND flash memory, which has got eight transistors in series. And that's in production today. Ever more exotic materials and processes, ever greater cost, which is great as long as you're dividing it by an ever greater number which means ever bigger markets required to justify the investments. But there are players, and they are playing. So inside your smartphone, your Apple smartphone today, inside this A7 chip, which if you've seen one is about an inch square, or three millimeters thick, um, quite, you know, it looks impressive, and you can see what's written on the top of it. There's actually three chips in there, stacked on top of one another. This is called 2.5D implementation because it's actually three individual chips. These are memory chips and this is the processor one. They're sat on top of one another. There's some more connectivity inside the package to connect them up to, into sensible configurations. And as I said earlier, the chip, the processor chip itself, has probably got 10 layers of metallization on top of it as well. So there's already a lot of this three-dimensional um, packaging going on in the products that you're buying in the market today. And this is round the corner. Um, one of the things which is very attractive about het heterogeneous integrated circuits or integration is the ability to put together chips of different natures. So a MEMS chip which has got mechanical components on it, so these little resonators and tiny micro machines up there you can put the gas sensors and things of that nature. CMOS RFC, um, power ICs, logic ICs, flash memory ICs, DRAM, SRAM, microprocessors, each one of which can be optimized for the particular domain that it's done and they're stacked on top of one another. And as the active layers of these things are really very thin, even when you stack 10 layers of metal on them, you've, the scale of the substrate is huge relative to the active layers. You can back grind them away to absolutely nothing. And here is an example of a 38 layer chip stack, and you can possibly just about make it out, 1.3 millimeters thick. 38 layers parked on top of each other. Now that is, that is a way of making 3D chips, of sticking together 2D chips. But people are doing it this way too, and that is actually creating process on top of process. So now we've got three layers of familiar integrated circuits which are, which are actually being created at the same time and joined together through great big wires which, which uh, make them into a solid block. So that's not, that's not different processes on each layer but it's making use of this vertical process. Now if you think for a moment <laughs> that in a die, let's not take even the biggest, most dense one, if you have a die with a billion transistors in it, if you put a billion layers on top of each other to make a cube, which is the size of a die which has got a billion transistors in it, now you tell me what the number is. It's got a lot of zeros, that's for sure. We can do things which are a billion times more complex than what we're doing today with this taking it into three dimensions. Now, that's not Moore's law as people have known it, because Moore's law as people have known it is two-dimensional. But this is now moving into what is three-dimensional processes, three-dimensional packaging. So it's the, it's the construction of things into that third dimension which will keep Moore's law going. Now, Moore's law, as we've already identified, he doesn't own it. He didn't really invent it. It was going before he was born. Um, and it's going to keep going because it's not really about the number of transistors that are on the, num on the circuit. It's about the functionals that are going into that encapsulation. That's what we're talking about. And that will go on despite the fact that CMOS has reached a limit which is determined by the size of the transistor. Because there's lots of other ways that we can put these things together. Lots of exciting ways. We're messing around at the 3, 4 to 10 level today. We've got the scope of going to a thousand, a hundred thousand levels. There's lots of scope left in Moore's Law. It's just not as he knew it. How am I doing? 31. Not many to go. Are you still happy? Yeah. 
good. Data processing then was the driver for electronics in 1947. This, was, this is um, Baby, Ma uh, University of Manchester's first computer, which was valve-based. Um, it was a general purpose stored program computer, so it was a proper computer. Very limited memory, um, very limited I.O., but it demonstrated the concept and is still the basic architecture of computers today. Still the basic architecture of the computer in your smartphone. But the thing that's happened in the meantime is now today, all of these things have got computers in. And today, these are the things which are where the volume is. And so these are the things which are determining where the money is coming from to, to, to support the advanced processes which are needed. It's a big change because the people who, when they were talking about baby, the people who were saying what needed to be done in the technology domain were professionals. Now it's the consumer that's saying which way the technology has to go. If you're a professional and you want to make yourself a supercomputer, then you have to use it based on the technology which is given to you by the market supported by the, the consumer. Professionals don't like that. <clears throat> so we see that the mainframe came first and it's still there. Like a lot of these processes, they don't go away. It's a different product in the sense that it's, uh, it's not now not limited by one MIP, it's limited by uh, uh, gigamips. Um, and other markets have come along to lead the technology forward. We're now in the mobile internet or internet of things. The scale is the hundreds of millions of objects and they, the technologies which are evolved are being driven by the, con by the consumer, not by the professional. So the old markets remain, so people still want mainframe computers, but they have to use the technologies that are available. And for those people who have been watching the press recently, they'll find that Little Arm, which is about as consumer processor as you can imagine, is the architecture of choice for the leading supercomputer, which is being, being made by Fujitsu and by the European Commission. Um, and Arm architecture, Little Arm, is the, is the processor that they're going to use. They're going to build, multiply it by millions. So they'll put millions of arms in this box, uh, but the arm architecture, the processes that they're going to be used are commercial processes, um, but it delivers a professional level of product to enable them to predict the weather and uh, air traffic control and how nuclear weapons explode. Because it still, still seems to be important. So a product is a commercial opportunity and design engineers, their role is to create a viable solution to a product opportunity. It has to work, it has to be economical, it has to be reproducible and it has to be innovative because if it isn't innovative it doesn't compete with, the, with its competitors. And the design engineer then is making a prediction for the future. How many other professions do you know where they predict the future with the sort of certainty that we've come to expect of engineering. People build bridges and they expect them to stand up. People, so we're not just talking about electronic engineering, we're talking about engineering altogether. They do that because the technologies are available. The sciences have been made available. The technologies are available. And what they're doing is putting them together in innovative ways. It's got to work. That's fundamental to it. And they've got to achieve timescales, cost, quality and certainty. Engineers get slated if they fail to predict the future accurately. Um, design engineer then has to be able to use appropriate available technology. So a design engineer has got to continue to learn what technologies are available and to continue to be innovative in the way that they're put together to deliver solutions which are competitive or, in, in, or actually more than that, who are sufficiently good that people are going to actually choose them as, a, as opposed to the alternative. Newest and fanciest doesn't do it, unless you're a sort of company which is up against the wall. What you've got to do is to do it securely, safely. It's about working with others, teams. It's inter international and external. It's about thinking around and about the problem and being ingenious. It's the, the root of the engineer, isn't it? The design engineer then, his role and her role is an endless pursuit of scientific learning. Don't feel that machines are ever going to replace you as an engineer and they're never going to replace you as a scientist either because scientists are discovering stuff that isn't known and you can't put a machine onto discovering stuff that isn't known. 
And engineers are about using stuff that is known in an innovative way. Neither of those can, can be done by machines. Scientists and engineers, we're here forever, guys. <laughs> conclusions. There is a last slide, is the first conclusion. So for the last 70 years, the use of the planar integrated circuit has transformed our lives. There's no doubt about that. Everything we do. Society has come to expect, because for the last 50 years that's been the case, all aspects of societal and individual need will be regularly improved performance through the use of this thing called new technology. But actually most people have no idea what that means. They know what the word technology is but they don't know what it means. Uh, Moore's Law has delivered this and that's probably the biggest problem that we face here is that Moore's Law has delivered it for the last 70 years and the assumption is it will continue to do so. But it was we know it can't go on like it has, it's got to change. As the transistor approaches the size of the atom, then it must end, even if it doesn't end at 5 nanometers, it certainly has to end at 0 0.5 of a nanometer. There's nothing below that as far as the atoms go. You wouldn't even know for sure where the, where the transistor was at that stage, <laughs> I suspect. Uh, uh, so Moore's Law will continue at the system level. And that's my conclusion. Uh, the solid state silicon electronic transistor is still fundamental to this but it's not the epicenter anymore the epicenter is how you make systems work how you design them how you make them work how you get any kind of yield out of it how you make it economically all of those things and the transistor is a fundamental part of it like cement is to a house it holds the bricks together it's a necessary part of it but it's not the core of it anymore 3D packaging, 3D packaging and assembly are the thing that will maintain Moore's law for a long time, maybe for a very long time. The size of the silicon atom is forcing a rethink of the future for planar technology, but, but, oh, that was another line, wasn't there? Full exploitation will take, will multiply silicon capacity a billion fold, big smiley. Thank you for listening. And uh, the report of my death is greatly exaggerated. I can take questions whether you want.